So out of all the small town communities in New Zealand that live off grassroots rugby, why Leporoa? Uh, we came across Reparoa largely, not by chance, but uh, we'd had the idea to make a film around a, a rural rugby club for quite some time, and we were uh, finishing our last film, How Far Is Heaven, and uh, happened to be driving through Rotorua down to, back down to Jerusalem, where, where we shot the last film, and uh, it, we'd kept our eye up for the right club for, for some time, as I mentioned, and uh, happened to see the Ripperoa Rugby Club from the main road, and I uh, thought, you know, this, this, this is, looks interesting, and um, we, we went back later on and uh, met the team, met the guys, and um, quickly felt that this was the, the club. Yeah. So what was the uh, first interaction like when you first presented the idea to them about making a film based on their well, community? Well, we'd, uh, well we, we sort of contacted the club president in the first instance and we just went down and watched the game and just chatted to people. But then uh, they gathered, then we went down another night when we were, felt sure that they, we did want to ask them if they would be interested in the documentary. We just gathered them all like after the rugby training and we, uh, we told them about our idea and that how the process would work and you know, how long it takes and everything. And they were just instantly, all of them were keen. <laughs> and Calvin, who's you know one of the stars of the film, his, his first res response was, um, always uh, said someone should make a film about us. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so from there we just, we rolled. And we did spend about a year of sort of development time. So we'd pop down for games and trainings and do little bits of filming and stuff. So over that time we felt sort of more and more sure that they were the right people and it was the right place. Uh, they just had the right sort of spirit. Um, we felt like this great sort of, camaraderie and they loved all the sort of rituals and stuff of that comes you know goes with rugby and they were just the right people and um, good natured and whatnot so so it didn't take that long for them to accept you as part of their community then no they were just really friendly they were delightful and um, so yeah through all those little warmings up we got to know people and then the we, you know, and we got our funding and things by the end, at the end of that year or early the next year and so then we just moved to live in Repro for the year and of course in that time that's when we really immersed ourselves in the community so then, you know, lots of, and we filmed, you know, from the word go with people, but we also do lots of things when we're not filming, like, you know, dinners and cups of tea and, you know, quiz nights and stuff. So, so you get to know people both when you're filming and they get to know how you, who you are as well. It makes everyone get more comfortable with each other. So um, after your previous film, How Far Was Heaven, which was also an observational documentary on a small town of Jerusalem, did you have to significantly change your filmmaking technique for the ground we want? Uh, no, I mean, we, we were going to employ a similar observational style, I think, um, and that stems from, you know, wanting to make the kind of films that we'd like to see, you know, and, and we don't really get to see that many purely observational kind of documentaries. Um, so we knew that was going to be the general approach, and we always. I mean, I think that's what we can do in, in many respects. Um, though the difference being uh, we were fairly certain we wanted to re rely even less on interviews. Um, and, uh, and we were fortunate enough to be able to do that. Um, we, we obviously had three, three small interviews with each of the main characters to provide a degree of context necessary. Um, but it was, it's, it's about, ultimately it's about showing, not telling, and, and you know, employing that kind of philosophy. And, and, it, and sort of technically, sorry, just basically how it works is like Chris is on the camera and I'm on like the sound boom, and so it's just the two of us. Yeah. And it just, that means, um, basically it means people get really comfortable with us and we with them, and because I think we're such a small little crew of two, it creates that intimacy as well with the camera, and we're just completely flexible with the scheduling as well, because we, we're just there to do that, so if we need to be up at dawn or filming all day into the night, we can just roll with it, because we're not sort of employing a extra crew, or we can jump on the back of a quad bike, or, you know, and so it makes it, I think it makes the, in terms of access and stuff, it makes it feel just so comfortable for people, and, um, yeah, so um, having a really small crew has huge advantages when it comes to the start of filmmaking, yeah. The idea of just rolling with it would seem extra crucial when filming those drinking scenes, I would have found, but did you find you ever had to change up how you filmed those particular scenes? Uh, no, it's, I mean, when you're behind the camera, it's, it's, you know, whether you're filming that or, you know, anything else, a cup of tea, there's, uh, 
you are faced with a myriad of choices and decisions that you have to make like this. You know, where you put the camera, where, where the light's coming from, where, where, you know, where might somebody walk or, or talk, you know. So you're trying to always sort of so, imagine what might happen in the next minute and you have no idea. So, so be it on the bus, rocking and swaying through the night on country roads or even, you know, just a simple, you know, cup of tea, you're, you're thinking about how you're going to cut given all the material you can, you know, gather with one camera, so. But we tend to, I guess, in terms of that sort of decision making, which is always sort of on the fly, but we tend to focus what we're filming around, like, because we have three central characters, essentially, and so we do tend to kind of prioritise filming them, I suppose, as part of the decision making. And then the rest of the things we're, we're looking for, like, when the team was together, when there were sort of ritual, rites and rituals, we call them, of, like, the rugby season, that's when we'd sort of focus on the guys as a whole, like, the huddle before going out into the field or the court session or, you know, things like that. And so you kind of, philosophically, you kind of know what you're looking for in terms of those filmmaking decisions, but you're just completely rolling with it. It kind of works in tandem with the saying about how for fictional films, the story is written by the screenwriter, whereas the story in documentaries is written by the editor. Was that completely the case here? Yeah, I mean, the editor and in the shooting because you know, whether, I mean, like, again, you know, where you put the camera it says so much, whether you shoot it in here or shoot it out here, if you, you know, get a three shot or a single, you know, there's so much of the storytelling taking place in the decision making of shooting it. And because I'm going to, I know I'm going to edit, I know basically how I'm trying to shoot things. And, um, and you're actually sort of making little story decisions the whole time when you're filming as well, which is like, kind of, um, because of course we had like, the three main characters, they were who we had chosen right at the start, but you always have to be open for maybe that not working out and maybe that someone else will appear. That's like, and so you're constantly kind of, um, so those little decisions are happening all the time and even what you choose to film that day, you know, like we just call around and see what people are up to, on like the farm, what they're doing, and so even all those things kind of are part of the story decision. But certainly this, it is written in the edit, and that's why oh, it's a huge job. Like it took about one year to edit the film. So um, obviously it's very, very centered on Kiwi masculinity. Well, a large part of Kiwi masculinity, which means that women aren't heavily featured in the film. Was that a decision you guys made from the very start? Yeah, yeah. So it was about taking a male perspective on, you know, male rites and rituals. Um, but doing so in a very conscious way, so it's not assuming, um, as we often do, um, a, you know, a, a male point of view in terms of the world around us. So, so we, um, yeah, we, I mean, there is absolutely a, probably, you know, another film <laughs> in terms of the, the female point of view, but it, to include that as well is, was just, you know, getting bigger and bigger and Could beyond you the scope. introduce more characters and then... So it would be like a six hour film. But we also just decided, yeah, let's just go into this male world and just be just wholehearted about it and yeah. take one point of view. And, and you see the women sort of on the periphery. Yeah, you see them in the world, but they're just sort of... Yeah. Um, and it was interesting, you know, like in the preparation for the film, you know, we, uh, we went and got, dutifully got our copy of A Man's Country by Jock Phillips. Um, but, you know, going to, looking at the shelves of, uh, you know, books in the gender studies section, you know, there's like one or two books about, you know, male identities, so... You yeah, know, we, we just thought like it was sort of high it's time, important, yeah. yeah. to be able to, to tell men's stories consciously as well. So for a townie like me, a townie male like me, are you hoping that I would be provoked by this film? Yeah, because I'm a townie male like you as well, and, and you know, this culture uh, and, you know, rugby and the culture that surrounds rugby is something that I've, you know, kept at arm's length all my life and have, you know, in many ways have found confronting and intimidating. Um, so a lot of what this film about, is about is, you know, confronting those things and um, exploring that. Um, so my, you know, I think through the process of this film, personally, you know, I've, I think I've come to make peace, actually, with um, that aspect of our culture. 
It's interesting because um, the premiere, which was a few nights ago, that was filled by townies and farmers. Mm. I'm not too sure if you had much of a chance to talk to each group, but was their reaction the same to the film? I just think it's really complex in this country because so many people like from the town grew up in the country or whatever, or people, friends of ours in the country grew up in the town. So, so I think there is kind of a bit of a crossover anyway. But certainly at the after party, there was a lot of great mingling going on. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was, I, I, we actually loved that about the night. That this was a chance for really like these two groups of people to come together. And, and it's kind of a sharing, I guess, of getting to know our culture in a deeper way. Lots of us, if we, like I grew up in, here in Auckland as well. So to actually feel and learn what it is like in a rural community is, a, I think, a real privilege for, for us townies. Out of everything, out of all the footage that didn't make the final edit, what was the most painful to cut? Um, in a way, it's, it's uh, you know, that, I mean, there's obviously lots of moments that are, you know, one of a kind, you'll never, never get to capture that sort of thing again, and it might just be a, a, a great line or you know, some sort of beautiful choreography of, you know, people and space and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but the, the painful stuff is, for me, in this film, were just those really small, quiet moments that reveal something very internal to a character, um, reveal something of their character um, that it's really beautiful, it's really insightful, but you know, it t takes too long to get there, or you know, there's too many reasons that it shouldn't be there. And, and you know, and that's the thing about the edit, it's, it's either progressing the narrative, or it's deepening the, the character, yeah. or it's like, it's gone. Yeah. And it's tough. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what's next for you both? Because if I was like the king of money, I would give you guys money just to sort of continue painting this picture of New Zealand by <laughs> filming each town that you pass <laughs> for a year and then editing that for another year just to get for, more. Forever and ever. Forever yeah. and ever. <laughs> that would make me happy, but in terms of filmmaking, is there anything else that you want to strive for? Yeah, this. Yeah, well, we basically we love this mode of filmmaking. We do intend to do this like forever and ever. But uh, we also do want to move into drama as well. I guess the big picture is we have to work in both, create and make drama as in actors and scripts and things. Um, but, still, but still with that we're looking to make it with small crews and, and you know a bit of, sort of improvisation so it's it kind of a fluid process like our documentary. So we are sort of working on some, um, some drama ideas as well as um, working towards our next documentary features. So that's the plan. Yeah and, and you know documentary wise we've, you know, we've got a a main city in our sites, as it were. So it's, it's you know, we're not we're not going to confine ourselves to small yeah. town. Um, it's it's so, not going to so be awkward. No, it's not going to be awkward. No. We get enough attention. <laughs> yeah, it's just sort of going into yes, whatever some world that we're keen to explore yeah. and, and be that in the city, albeit not. Yeah. Mm. Great. Thank you both for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.